Okay, let's uh, let's uh, get uh, organized here. You got questions? Okay. Okay, I would uh, recognize the uh, gentleman uh, from Texas, Mr. Capo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm impressed with the uh, GAO's ability to uh, get to the truth, and I appreciate all three of you, your candor testimony instead of double talk, which we seem to hear a lot of down here. And uh, uh, my I have three questions. You've uh, described, I think, in very detail the total, in my opinion, lack of uh, uh, the ability to test people who are uh, driving these 18-wheelers throughout the country. And in spite of the fact this committee and the sense of the House is that uh, the administration should not move forward with bringing in uh, Mexican trucks, uh, of course, we got the assurance from the Transportation Department all these truck drivers coming in from south of the border are going to be tested, drug tested. Do you have any comments at all on the ability of Mexico to test its truck drivers that are coming into the United States? Do you know anything about their labs, their sampling, their process, if it exists? We have not looked at that in our ongoing work in GAO. Well, I'm not sure you'd be able to find any of those labs down there in Mexico, but uh, if at some point the GAO needs another project, uh, maybe that would be a good one uh, to find out what's happening because now we're bringing in thousands of more truckers into the United States and we have no control over that testing procedure. It disturbs me a great deal. Uh, when I was uh, on the bench in, in Texas for forever, well, we had the same problem of drug testing found that hair samples was one of the best ways to find out if people uh, continued to use drugs. I say, say that to get to uh, the second question. What is your opinion about, uh, you can call it national database or registry system, trucker driver, truck driver goes to business one, he flunks for whatever reason, whether he's using you know, methamphetamines, amphetamines, or anything else, cocaine. So he waits it out, and then he goes to the second business, another trucking company. Am I correct that the second business has no record that he flunked a test with the first business? Is that a correct statement? Mr. Poe, that is a correct statement, as long as he did not reveal that on his job application. Well, you know, someone might even tell him, but probably not. What is your opinion of having a system where person flunks at business, trucking business number one. Trucking business number one puts the driver's license, the social security number, something, into a registry that is monitored, supervised by the federal government, not paid for by the taxpayers, but supervised by the federal government, where the trucking industry itself is able to pull up individuals to find out if they flunk, flunked with one business or another. Do you have an opinion on something like that? Uh, Mr. Poe, we are looking at in, that in our ongoing work. Um, it's important to know that there are a couple of states that are doing that, so we plan to look at those to see how those models are working in terms of getting the information out, in terms of accuracy, timeliness, and, uh, and the extent to which then motor carriers are able to act on that information. Uh, the Motor Carriers Administration did do a study on this concept a few years ago uh, that was largely a positive study, feeling that it would deal with really two problems one being the one you mentioned of moving from job to job without revealing a past drug test, the other being that motor carriers are expected to um, comply with federal requirements to actually do an inquiry in this area, and it is difficult for them to do so if they don't have the information that they need. Uh, so we will be looking into that as a concept to address several of the problems that we've outlined in our statement today. And with the states that, you, that are doing this, is it paid for by the trucking industry? I do not have that information, Mr. Poe. It would seem to me that it'd be advantageous for the trucking industry to finance that some way, 
because as a trial lawyer, if a guy flunked one place and he goes somewhere else and he's in a wreck, I'd be suing that company because they didn't have due diligence about the first situation. So it seemed like it would be to their interest to, plus highway safety, uh, to, to have such a system. But uh, do, and lastly, do you, do you think the system is feasible by having the trucking industry support the system? I really don't have a comment on that yet, Mr. Poe. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Poe. Um, at this point, uh, I think we're going to move on to the next panel. I do just one question since he raised the issue of the Mexican contracts. I was at the border 10 days ago with the secretary, and um, they're doing inspecting the trucks at the border. But my understanding is that the drug testing is being done within the commercial zone, but not at the border. So it's being done through collection facilities within the commercial zone. Um, do we have any inclination or information that, that those are at operating in a different way than the one, the problems we've identified here with collection facilities? Uh, in our discussions with FMCSA staff, they had told us that they have sent additional personnel into those zones to sp pay more attention to those collection sites than they typically do in other parts of the country. Okay. So be inspecting more than 2% of them on an annual basis. Uh, that is my understanding. Right. But of course, there's even, even if they are following the standards, as Dr. Smith has said, you know, basically only an imbecile could not figure out how to beat the test following the standards. I mean, as we said in our statement, that even if you have full compliance with all aspects of the drug testing mm -hmm. program, there are still ways that uh, drivers that use drugs can continue to drive a motor right. vehicle. Okay, thank you. Ms. Duncan, do you, oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bozeman uh, came in. John? Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, Mr. Chairman, I, I, do we have the same problem across the board with uh, physicians when they go, when they're uh, being monitored, uh, airline pilots, uh, uh, people that work on trains, things like that. I mean, we're, we're really talking about two things. We're talking about the problems of the industry as a whole uh, in the drug testing industry, and then the other thing, you know, specifically as it occurs to, to truck drivers. But uh, do we see the same thing, Dr. Smith? And, uh we do not see the same thing, particularly in uh, the aviation industry or in the railroad industry. How do they do it different? They're different, I think, because, for example, in the rail industry, it's our experience that the vast majority of those specimen collections are actually done on railroad property with very well-trained and dedicated teams who come in and collect the specimens. There's almost always a supervisor present from, from the railroad, as an example. Aviation, uh, uh, the vast majority of random tests, et cetera, on aviation safety-sensitive personnel are also similarly conducted at airport property or aviation company property, frequently again using you know, personnel that are trained that do that month after month in comparison to So other. we have a much looser process than with the, uh, with the trucking industry. Well, certainly, because a truck driver that works for an over-the-road hauler, for example, might have a random test done in any of 48 states at any, you know, near any truck stop or near wherever. And so it's extraordinarily difficult for the motor carrier to control that. Right. Uh, Mr. Cutts, under, under the things that you all found, under current law, was there anything that was considered criminal, the violations that you saw? No, not necessarily. No. Okay. Uh, has there been any criminal prosecution of the industry for any of these things? or? that any of you all are aware of? Uh, Mr. Bozeman, let me take a step back and answer that a couple of different ways. Um, I, I mentioned in my statement that there, there are still a fair amount, there's still a fair amount of noncompliance found when FMCSA does compliance reviews of motor carriers themselves in terms of having a program that meets the federal standards. <clears throat> in those cases, FMCSA does have the ability to uh, use fines and compliance orders, for example, to try to get that motor carrier to get its drug testing program up to snuff. With regard to the collection site issue that we've been talking about, uh, FMCSA does not have that same enforcement authority. What it can do is take steps to remove that, uh, that particular collection site or set of collection sites from the DOT drug testing program. 
So have they ever done that? Have they removed sites? Uh, there have been a, a number of what there's called a public, it's called a public interest exclusion. There have been a number of these efforts started. To my knowledge, in most cases, either the collection site has dropped out of the program or come into compliance. Okay, so, but they really haven't kicked anybody out. N not that I know of. Okay, so I guess, I, I guess the only thing I would say, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really matter what we do if there's no enforcement mechanism. It just doesn't work. Well, the, enforce, the enforcement issue with regard to collection sites is, is one that I think this, both the Motor Carrier Safety Administration and this committee should be considering. Okay, okay thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Ms. Duncan. Uh, just uh, very briefly, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, uh, obviously we can't really know, or we don't really know at this point, how many of these uh, two million tests each year are, are bad or illegitimate or cheated on or whatever, but uh, the, the implication or the gist of your uh, testimony is that, that, uh, that uh, <coughs> cheating or uh, falsifying these tests is, is pretty widespread and rampant, uh, uh, primarily because of all the uh, goods that are being advertised over the internet and for other reasons. And what I'm, what I'm getting at is this, uh, uh, law enforcement they know that they get just a tiny, they, they uh, stop just a very tiny percentage of the speeders each year. They do, they, they catch a, a much higher percentage of uh, the more serious crimes, but even thousands of murders go unsolved each year. So wh what, I'm, what I'm wondering about is this, instead of doing two million tests that we regard as joke tests or questionable tests, would we, would we be better off to uh, uh, go on the deterrence theory that most law enforcement, it, it, most law enforcement is based on the fact that it, it, while we know we're not going to solve even a tiny fraction of these crimes, at least there's a deterrence value out there that they think stops many other people from committing the crime. So would we be, be better off with some much lesser number of tests, but tests that would be clearly legitimate, that would be random, that would be uh, personally observed uh, and and tests that would be thorough and authentic, 50,000 or 100,000 of those, would we be better off with something like that or are we better to stay with the system that we've got? Well, I would just comment on that. I mean, I think everything should be on the table here. I mean, we're looking, we're, everything's looking for the same thing, an improved process. I don't think anybody's happy with the results of what we've had today and certainly you know, I wouldn't be happy with respect to us going in 24 out of 24 times and potentially beating this test. So um, something different has to be done, and uh, that could be an option that should be on the table. I mean, I wouldn't dismiss it necessarily. All right, anybody else want to comment? I honestly believe that the Department of Transportation's drug and alcohol testing program and policy is well-founded and well-crafted. I think that. It can be effective, and, and despite its shortcomings that we've talked about here today, I think there are some statistics that show that it has been effective from a deterrent perspective okay. in terms of reducing the prevalence of illicit drug use by workers in the transportation industries over the past 10 years. If we can but fine tune the program that we have in the areas that we've talked about today, I am convinced that it can be and is an effective federal program for the deterrence and detection of illegal drug use. We're talking about national databases to prevent going from state to state or job to job. We're, I'm talking about making mandatory specimen validity testing and giving the laboratories and HHS more, more bulk to be able to go after the, uh, the people that, that produce these uh, substances talking about being able, again, to utilize the pie and other processes to weed out those providers that are not committed to following the procedures and upholding the integrity of the process. I don't think the system, in terms of the rules, the program is broken. I think the execution right. in terms of its enforcement right. is where our problem is lying. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I just, the, the, he provoked one last question for me and then we will move on. But you said in the last 10 years we've seen a big improvement, but the, you know, since 97 we have the 1.6 to 2.0 percent reported 
uh, problem. Oregon has the 9%. We have self-reporting at 7.4. Um, and since we've had that consistency in the, in the most conservative number over those 10 years, I don't know how we can say that we've made big progress. You're right in terms of looking, if you only look at drug test positive numbers. But I would suggest that there are other barometers for measuring the effectiveness of this program as a deterrent. If you look, for example, to the Department of Health and Human Services household survey data, which admittedly is self-report, but nonetheless has had a standardized series of questions over the years, you can see that those individuals, when polled anonymously, that who work in transportation industries today, who say they are current users of illicit drugs, is, is less mm -hmm. than those who responded to that same question, workers in transportation industries 10 years ago. You've not seen the same significant decrease in the general population at large. You've seen some decrease. I think that is but one measure, sir. Mm -hmm. I, you know, okay. granted, it doesn't necessarily prove my point. Sure. No, I appreciate it. Okay, I thank, I thank this panel for their excellent uh, testimony. Uh, here's the way I would hope to proceed. I, I, I appreciate the indulgence of time that the, uh, um, uh, John Hill, uh, the administrator, and uh, 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 Robert Stevenson uh, from uh, SAMHSA have shown. What I would like to do is still have, I think it would be instructive before, I, I, I won't put you last, but, but I think it would be instructive to hear from North Carolina and Oregon because I think it raises, first we have an issue, a state that has addressed a lot of the problems that have been uh, laid out here today, as far as I can tell from their testimony, and then we have the question of is there a bigger problem from Oregon? So if you can possibly hang in, uh, I'd like to do it that way. Okay, all right, thank you. So we would now have uh, uh, Mr. John uh, Wilburn Williamson and Sergeant Alan Hageman. Okay, we'll start with Mr. Williamson. Uh, I've read your testimony. You're not bound by it. If you want to, if you want to read it, that's fine. If you want to depart from it, given the preceding panel, would be happy with that too. Go right ahead. You got five minutes. How's that? Oh, boy from North Carolina, still learning some tricks here. How's that? Okay. First of all, I'd like to take the opportunity, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, to let you know how honored we are to be here today representing the great state of North Carolina, Governor Mike Easley and Department of Transportation and our Division of Motor Vehicles. In late 2004, we were approached by the North Carolina Public Transportation Association with a problem they had with transit drivers testing positive for drugs and alcohol, being dismissed from employment, and a few weeks later, when, when the driver felt comfortable, he or she would test negative for pre-employment testing, be hired by another transit company and driving a passenger bus the next day. The association and division worked jointly on legislation which would address this problem. This joint effort resulted in the positive drug test reporting law. That bill was signed by Governor Mike Easley and became effective on December 1 of 2005. The law states that an employer who has an employee who tests positive for drugs or alcohol per the federal regulation must report the positive to the division within five days of receiving notification from a lab that the driver had tested positive. Once the division receives notification of the positive results, we send the driver a letter. This letter gives the effective date of the disqualification, which is 20 days from the date of the letter and informs the driver that a preliminary hearing is allowed. If the driver requests a hearing, he or she must do so within 20 days. The hearing may only address the testing protocol and procedures used by the lab. Once the driver is disqualified, the motor vehicle record will show the date of the disqualification followed by the general statute number. Uh, the motor vehicle record will not indicate directly the reason for the city of disqualification. For a driver to end the disqualification, the division must receive verification from a substance abuse professional 
that the employee driver has successfully completed the substance abuse assessment program. The disqualification will end on the date the completion is received by the Division of Motor Vehicles. The disqualification history remains on the motor vehicle report for a period of two years. The statistics which I'm about to give you are from the positive test reported, from the positive test reported to us from February 2006 when we received our first positive through October 17th of this year, or about 20 months. During that time, we have received 54 positive tests have been reported to us, 357 of which remain currently active disqualifications. 150 of the drivers who tested positive have completed the substance abuse assessment program. We have 20 current pending disqualifications sitting there in that 20-day 20, 20 window. 17 reported positives were not disqualified due to the completion of the substance abuse assessment program prior to the disqualification uh, going onto the record, going into effect. North Carolina has had 62 hearings requested and only 49 actually conducted. There were 13 that were canceled uh, or the driver did not appear. North Carolina has had no official media campaign and the motor carrier or the employers are learning from the new law by contact contact with the North Carolina Highway Patrol Motor Carrier Section, which conducts motor carrier audits. Uh, the North Carolina Trucking Association website has information about our program. Uh, the North Carolina Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, the motor carrier auditors who go out and audit these motor carriers as well, the North Carolina Division of Motor Vehicles, commercial driver's license compliance officers as well are out there doing audits. With over 325,000 CDL holders and approximately 23,000 in interstate carriers in North Carolina, unfortunately, we firmly believe we have only scratched the service to a problem that exists statewide. Some key program benefits are North Carolina disqualifies the driver from driving legally until he or she has completed the substance abuse assessment program. We provide an incentive to the drivers with a substance abuse problem who for the first time are given an incentive to receive treatment and address their problem. Equally as important, by placing a disqualification on the motor vehicle record, the division is collecting data as it pertains to the positive tests. This helps the trucking industry identify problem drivers and protects the motoring public. An example of this is of the 544 positives 53 have been reported from the school bus driver population. Of the 53 positives, we know that 27 tested uh, positive for marijuana, 23 for cocaine, one for amphetamines, one for alcohol, and one just flat out refused to take the test, which is also reportable as a positive. The ability to collect such data is benefit alone for North Carolina to justify the cost of the taxpayers and more than enough to justify our time and efforts with this highway safety initiative. In closing and on a personal note, I have learned a valuable lesson while working on this program. We in the highway safety field must keep an open ear to all private sector groups who have an interest in highway safety. The North Carolina Public Transportation Association had a problem. We learned the problem not only affected them, but affected the segments of the entire commercial industry. North Carolina Division of Motor Vehicles, Commissioner Bill Gore, Jr. and Deputy Commissioner Wayne Herter would like to publicly thank the North Carolina Public Transportation Association, North Carolina Trucking Association, and this president, Charlie Deal, for all their support, and the North Carolina Administrator for FMCSA, Chris Hartley, and his staff for their assistance. The North Carolina Division of Motor Vehicles website has instructions and information on our law, positive drug test reporting, and you may go there at www.ncdot.org slash DMV slash forms. Thank you for giving me the honor to be here and speak with you today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Sergeant. Thank you. Chairman DeFazio and distinguished members of the thank you. Chairman DeFazio and distinguished members of the subcommittee, uh, first, um, thank you for the honor of speaking before you today. Um, I am Alan Higman. I'm a sergeant with the Oregon State Police assigned to the patrol division at General Headquarters. And I'm here today to briefly summarize Oregon's finding in drug testing of our truck driving population 
and to make a single recommendation which I believe will improve our performance in reducing the number of impaired motor vehicle drivers on our highways. Uh, just a brief summary of uh, what we found is we've been conducting these uh, what we call trucker checks uh, since the fall of 1998. It was the vision of uh, now retired Captain Chuck Hayes. Um, basically what these trucker checks involve is a uh, uh, 72 hours straight of operation at any of our seven ports of entry where these um, trucks come in, they're randomly chosen for uh, enforcement of the Federal Motor Carrier regulations of both drivers and, uh, and their equipment. We also have an emphasis in looking at drivers for impairment, either alcohol, drugs, or fatigue. And one of the things that Captain Hayes wanted to introduce into the first trucker check, which he did, was um, urine testing. And to maximize the participation, and he asked that it be voluntary and uh, uh, anonymous so that uh, there would be no inhibition about giving urine. He had very high compliance in that. Um, he repeated it again in the fall of 1999. Um, the first time we did this, we were surprised we got results back that about 9.5% of the um, urine samples tested positive for one or more uh, of the drug categories that were tested. Again, we repeated this in 1999, and the um, uh, results were up around 15% uh, due to an increase in amphetamine. Uh, I have no explanation for what that spike is in amphetamines, and we haven't seen it since. Um, in any case, now under the leadership of uh, Captain Jerry Gregg, there was an interest in uh, revalidating this study. So last April, uh, we did another trucker check, this time in Woodburn, and we did the same test under the same, we conducted the whole trucker check under the same template as we did under the original ones, and um, uh, we again received results of about 9.5%. Uh, backing up a little bit in my testimony, um, our Oregon legislature in 1999 did do a, uh, take some legislative action to address what was being discovered then, which was to, um, it was designed to exceed the US DOT testing requirements uh, found in part 40. Unfortunately, the language is crafted in such a way that it doesn't have a lot of teeth. So as I speak to you right now, the uh, Oregon DOT is developing another legislative concept that will increase the existing, uh, enhance the existing statutory language. Um, currently, the only two states that I could locate that, that uh, have good legislation in this area are Washington and North Carolina. Um, Oregon can become very proactive in drug testing. However, the interstate nature of trucking severely limits the effectiveness of Oregon's effort unless there is interstate uniformity. And that's why I'm here to uh, ask you to consider that we have some type of a nationwide clearinghouse which will report all positive refusals, in, including um, all positive tests, including refusals. Um, the interstate motor carrier should be required to contact this clearinghouse before employing any driver. Uh, that's uh, been a privilege to speak before you today, and I hope what I've shared with you is some value in improving our safety of nation's <laughs> highways, and I'm honored to answer any of your questions. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Williamson, the uh, the programs that uh, I, I like what you said in terms of it, it certainly would give an incentive to someone who has to make a living driving and they need to get their record cleared up. Um, who established the criteria for the programs and, and, you know, I mean, to make certain that the person goes through, you know, a real treatment program? Does the state monitor those programs or? Uh, yes, well, actually, uh, that list comes from the Federal Motor Carrier. Um, and we also send a list of uh, substance abuse assessment professionals who can um, uh, handle that, that treatment when we send that letter out of notification of a disqualification. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. And then um, on the, uh, the, the issue of your database, um, who can access that under what conditions? Okay. Currently, that is and it's strictly an in-house thing, our adjudication branch. Um, we have uh, two hearing officers who have, have access to that system um, and the facility or the room where we keep these records that um, it has its own fax machine, its own phone line, and everything comes in there and stays in that, that area. Um, so there is an area we do consider that a private type mm -hmm. situation. So you're... Your hook is you've re you've taken their state license, so but this isn't the we've been talking about sort of a different clearinghouse concept in the first panel where a, a, a prospective employer could access it and get a hit yes or no. no. 
as, and and you don't you don't allow that. I mean, because you're figuring since you've taken the person's license, no one would need to contact you. The, I mean, you you don't need to provide access to prospective employers. Well, actually. What, what occurs when we receive notification and, and the person does not request a hearing, uh, that disqualification goes on that individual's motor vehicle re record. Mm -hmm. It shows uh, CDL disqualification. It gives the general statute number. Uh, and being on his motor vehicle record, it is record to just that. Whoever, um, by the Driver Privacy Protection Act, um, who would have access legally to that to that motor vehicle record would see that on there. Mm -hmm. Which would be uh, a prospective employer with a release could access that? Does it require a release? That is correct, sir. Yeah, okay. All right, and and you feel that the process you put in place with the 20 days for the hearing and that, because we had concerns earlier about someone having recourse if they felt the test wasn't properly administered or whatever, you, I mean, you haven't had people go on and appeal and then subsequently litigate and claim that you know you you know you didn't give them a fair hearing and the system wasn't adequate to clear their name and they were unjustly accused have you had any litigation like that no sir I've not had any challenges as of this point um, just they would come to the hearing and mm -hmm. that's about it okay. uh, sergeant uh, someone mentioned Oregon earlier and saying that we what, what do we do in terms of what record, uh, when someone is found to have had a positive drug test, what, what, are we, what, are we, what, what are we doing in Oregon? The medical review officer is required to report that to Oregon DOT, more specifically DMV. The problem is it kind of lingers in a database that no one's required to access or no one's required to disclose. And it only includes positives, it doesn't include refusals. So there's this database that basically is, um, for all intents and purposes, meaningless. Right, and that's something the legislature or policymakers are looking at to make that more useful and, and uh, more inclusive. Yeah, Chair DeFazio, I think we're looking at North Carolina as sort of a template on that and uh, uh, be the same thing as disqualifying the driver until steps are taken to, uh, uh, to correct it. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, uh, Mr. Duncan. Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay, well, uh, I thank you, I think, uh, You've contributed to the dialogue here, and uh, now we're going to have, uh, you might hang around and hear what the administrator's response is. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. Yes, sir. Uh, with that, I thank, again, I thank uh, Administrator Hill for his very generous uh, allocation of, uh, of time, and also, uh, I've lost track of my agenda here. Uh, he's accompanied by uh, Mr. Jim uh, Swart, Acting Director, Office of Drug and Alcohol policy and compliance, and uh, then, uh, and then uh, Mr. Robert L. Stevenson, Director, Division of Workplace Programs, Substance Abuse, and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, we'd start with uh, Administrator Hill, and uh, you can, I've read your testimony, but you, you're free to do with your five minutes as you wish. Uh, I realize there are sometimes constraints put upon officials by uh, their higher ups in terms of what you can do or depart from, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Duncan. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, give the FMCSI side to this issue and uh, your interest in highway safety. We are responsible for regulating about 4.2 million employees, 600,000 employers. FMCSA has an aggressive program to examine. Uh, compliance with the drug and alcohol regulations through roadside inspections, safety audits, and compliance reviews. The agency also takes every opportunity to educate the industry regarding the drug and alcohol testing regulations. And data indicates that CMV operators are among the safest transportation workers in the U.S. NHTSA's Fatality Analysis Reporting System, otherwise known as FARS, from 1997 to 2006 showed alcohol intoxication average 1 percent in crashes each year. It should also be noted that the alcohol intoxication level for a commercial vehicle operator is at 0.04 percent blood alcohol compared to the higher 0.08 percent for passenger vehicle operators. During use in the same FARS report, the same 10-year period, uh, drug use in that period of time for commercial vehicle operators was 1 percent. 
Our last survey has been mentioned today is at 1.7, it doesn't show too much differentiation over the last 10 years. Now, while these data are positive, we acknowledge that the, any commercial vehicle that has a driver behind the wheel with controlled substance is too many. And I pledge to work with the GAO and this committee to take proactive in initiatives uh, that will deal with this problem. And I want to also tell you that we've already taken some of those initiatives, and I want to explain some of those to you. Uh, we have applied limited resources for a very large carrier population using a risk-based approach in addressing safety priorities that has produced some significant results. Last year, we reviewed compliance of more than 55,000 drug and alcohol testing programs during our compliance reviews and new entrant audits. We also see state and local roadside enforcement playing a crucial role in detecting illegal drug usage. And one such example was in Maryland earlier this year when a semi-tractor trailer driver was stopped for running well over the speed limit. Cocaine was found in the vehicle. The trooper revealed uh, through this process that the, not only did he possess uh, cocaine, but he was under the influence at the time he was driving. And we as the agency used our authority and declared him an imminent hazard and had him disqualified. Fortunately, the state of Florida worked with us to have that CDL revoked. We've also begun to use data in which the driver tested positive for drug and has not completed the return to do, duty process, which you've heard about today. We are following uh, this process. We're removing drivers from the highways. I'll be glad to talk more about it in the question and answer period and, and expound on it. But we also believe that the strategy that you just heard from North Carolina about licensing and, and disqualifying drivers is a, is a positive step, and we look forward to working with other states in that regard. Our Comprehensive Safety Analysis 2010, CSA 2010, recognizes the need to collect more comprehensive data regarding drug and alcohol compliance. Therefore, our staff is currently developing strategies for requiring collection of drug and alcohol testing information to ensure that our new drug, uh, our compliance model is able to identify drivers and carriers that do not comply with drug and alcohol regulations and to prevent their continued operation. You'll be seeing uh, more about that in a proposed rulemaking next year. As a former law enforcement official, I have seen firsthand the consequences of impaired driving behind CMVs and passenger vehicles. And some states have taken steps to criminalize products and circumvent the, that circumvents the drug and testing process, and I certainly support these efforts, including federal legislation to prohibit their manufacture and distribution. And most carriers use service agents to collect drug testing programs, as we heard about today. Uh, we reviewed compliance of these entities during our compliance review process and have found 22,000 violations in the past seven years. DOT has worked with the drug testing and transportation industries to give special emphasis to collection site integrity. We have also asked our inspectors and auditors to increase their scrutiny of collection sites. We will continue to find new ways to ensure comprehensive programs aimed at identifying non-compliant driver and carriers with the alcohol and controlled substance regulations. And I do look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, GAO, and our state partners to improve compliance in this area. Thank you, and I'll answer your questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee, I'm Robert Stevenson, Director of Division of Workplace Programs. Could I just pull the mic a little closer there? I can't quite, I'm having okay. trouble hearing. Um, Division of Workplace Programs and the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention within the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, SAMHSA, of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. On behalf of our administrator, Terry Klein, uh, we thank you for holding this important hearing, too. Uh, following the lead of your earlier comments, uh, I'd look around and see that most of the issues and concerns we had originally come prepared to testify about have already been put out on the table. So uh, we have withdrawn our normal uh, oral testimony, and I'm going to try to respond in this limited time to some of the issues that have been raised and tell you a little bit more about who we are and what it is we do and try to anticipate some of the questions you might ask, but I know I won't be totally successful. Excellent. Go right ahead. Uh, first of all, the HHS roles. We're responsible for the administrative and technical standards procedures for executive branch federal employees. That's our authority and that's our responsibility. Uh, this was initially established by executive order back in 1986, and we established uh, mandatory guidelines for 
the testing and programs that needed to be set up by executive branch agencies back in 1988. And we've been in business ever since then. A lot of the capacity that we have uh, is to test other agencies under their own separate authority. But they use our standards by their decisions and by their incorporation under their rules and, and processes. Uh, currently, we certify 46 laboratories in the United States and Canada. We have 114 inspectors who perform two inspections per year on each one of those laboratories, and where they physically go into those places and spend at least a day, and in some cases, several days. Uh, one of the questions that was asked was, why publish a playbook in the Federal Register of what, what it is about the adulterants? Well, the bottom line is that I'm equally frustrated by that process, too, but it's required under our Administrative Procedures Act. We need to, to propose things uh, through notice and comments, and there was a, a fairly um, important case decision that kind of cemented the need to do what we're doing, that is putting out any modifications to uh, testing protocols, procedures, cutoff levels, and so forth that are instructions to the labs that are to be performed on specimens collected for federal agency employees, and by extension, uh, the DOT regulated industry. We have to put those into a Federal Register notice beforehand. We have to receive comments on them, and then we have to, to publish it. That puts the, the lead time way out in advance for anybody who wants to willfully uh, manipulate their products to, to change it. So we could do this time and time again, and it will result in a, a blatant behavior of changing products um, and ignoring any of the, you know, there's no fairness in it. They, they've got all the uh, ground advantages in the process. Why can't you test uh, and, and detect these adulterants? Well, when we had uh, a process where we aggressively used the, the insight of our laboratorians uh, to look for anomalies in the specimens being tested, and then they identified a new adulterant, and then uh, we learned from our experience in a couple of important court cases that were, by the way, DOT cases, that we needed to publish these processes up front. What we found out was that uh, you needed a second lab to be able to uh, respond to a legal challenge that would be raised when one of the adulterant issues was brought up in a specific court case. And in most situations, uh, that worked well in the early years, but it, it came about that the only other lab that had the kind of uh, corporate mentality and, and will to do this uh, dissolved or became an asset of another uh, laboratory corporation. And so we lost the capacity to have a second lab do this. We explored opportunities with the Department of Transportation of using perhaps a, a resource that they had under the FAA, uh, Aerospace Medical Laboratory, to do some of this kind of super lab retesting and so forth. But that has not produced any result. as a re as a result of that, what we had chosen to do, and it was at the request of DOT, we truncated the process whenever we saw anything funky in a particular specimen being tested, and, and it, as quickly as possible turned the results around showing that it was an invalid test for, for testing. And, and it was an invalid specimen, and we could not do laboratory testing on it for a variety of reasons. It just wouldn't go through the process well. We didn't identify a specific adulterant in it, but we knew there was something wrong. So the best we could do was to turn the specimen result around very quickly and get it back into the hands of the MRO, who in turn would then suggest we need to do a direct observation recollect, maybe in a couple of days, rather than chasing oh, after an elusive adulterant that you might or might not find for four or five days, and then by then a person has had enough time to clean their system out. They had enough lead warning. So that was the best we could do of that process. I would. Totally agree. I would love to see a process where we didn't have to put that playbook out in advance. I, but I don't know how to get around that under administrative procedures rules. Uh, the, the, the last uh, real thing was, what about alternative specimens? We published um, proposed rules for um, federal agency employees to be used by federal agencies back in uh, April of 2004. 
And during the internal review process, uh, there were issues raised by other federal agencies and, and departments about some of the issues around um, fairness, hair color bias, legal concerns that have not allowed those to go forward to a final process. But we did move forward with the urine portion of it to address issues around collection site concerns, certification of MROs, and we separately published the adulterant instructions in, in 2004 as a final, and it went into effect in November of 2004 because we were concerned about what was going on. By 2005, we had provided testimony uh, the first time about the problems that were going on in, uh, in the industry that we're seeing ad adulterant products and substituted specimens. And then the last one was, what about testing for more and different drugs? Well, one of the issues raised, I think, in the Oregon experience was that they were doing screening tests on some of the, the, the drivers, and they were finding uh, what could have been prescription drugs. The comment was made in testimony, I think, in the oral testimony, that it was illicit drugs or illegal drugs. Well, we don't really know that. What we know is that when you come up with a prescription drug uh, test result, you then need to determine whether or not the person had a prescription for that and whether we're using it in accordance with that prescription. If we test for more drugs, the issue is going to be a, a resurfacing of a problem we've had in the past where we test for a number of different drugs like benzodiazepines uh, or the other opiates for chronic pain issues. Uh, if the person who's taking that drug has got a prescription and a medical review officer reviews that, they would say that it's a negative drug test for the purposes of the program. But I would raise an issue of concern about the safety about using some of these drugs in a work environment where that kind of sedation or other issues could be a concern. That's an issue to think about when you look about, uh, think about expanding a panel to add other drugs. At this time, I'd just like to indicate our written testimony talks more about what we do as a federal agency, as HHS, and about our role with the federal agency programs, and I'm prepared to answer any questions I can. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Hill, on page three of your prepared uh, testimony, it said this, talking about uh, dealing with uh, the idea of a national database or registry, the study concluded it is feasible to establish a national database of positive drug results. If a database were established, the report recommends that it be operated by the federal government to ensure consistency and uniformity. Uh, FMCSA is moving forward to address this problem. The report was in 2004. Can you tell me what you're doing to move forward and what kind of timeline we have for a federal database? Mr. Chairman, uh, one of the frustrations that I've had in, in dealing with this coming from a state in law enforcement as I have been aware of this problem for some time, as these gentlemen indicated earlier in the panel. And so I began to ask questions in the agency, and I was repeatedly told that the privacy concerns outweigh the uh, ability of the, of the, the department to move forward in this regard. And so we have been working, in spite of that, we're going to work through the Comprehensive Safety Analysis, CSA 2010. We're developing the structure right now and plan to publish a notice for pools rulemaking in early 2008 that will deal with a requirement to have medical review officers submit positive te uh, drug tests to us so that we can create some kind of a database that will allow us to know what the performance of carriers is actually happening. Now, I haven't got the rule ready for prime time, but we're, we're far along in this process. This isn't an idea. This isn't a, a thought process. This is something that we actually have worked with our attorneys on, and what we plan to do at this point is to use, as you indicated earlier in response to uh, the North Carolina gentleman, uh, a waiver by the employee that if they're going to have a safety sensitive position, they're going to have to make uh, agreement to allow this information to be used by those people who regulate them. And if they don't, they won't be allowed to continue in the process. Now, I really think that as you've seen with hours of service and other kinds of high priority issues in this country with involving commercial vehicles, there are a lot of different moving parts. And I think there will be litigation. And I think legislatively, if there were support for creating this database, it would make it an easier 
uh, process to go through, but we are prepared to roll up our sleeves with your staff, move forward on this. In fact, we're already moving forward, and we're going to go forward with it because I believe it's so critical to public safety. Well, I, I think you heard the chairman earlier. I believe that he, and I can speak for myself, uh, I w would like to move forward with legislative support uh, for this process. I think it's essential. And in terms of the privacy concerns, um, you know, we have a database uh, to determine a person's eligibility to legally acquire a firearm. Uh, we don't reveal any sensitive information about the person. It's just a yes or a no. Uh, and it could be a similar system, uh, you know, which is, no, you've got a, you've got a problem here. Uh, and uh, you better go contact the FMCSA if you think that's in error, uh, and they have an appeals process, and you can get your record cleared up, or, you know, or whatever, or if you haven't completed your rehab program, you'll have to go do it, or, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, but it seems to me that the, the privacy issues have been dealt with in other databases, and we could certainly deal with them here. Uh, and I appreciate your support for that, and I think we will try and give you legislative support. Um, what about the... Uh, the, the, the whole issue of the integrity of, of the testing process. You certainly heard some very devastating testimony regarding that. I mean, 100% failure rate, um, you know, and, and I read earlier some comments that uh, had been submitted to a GAO in response to that, that, you know, the future uh, real ID licenses, you know, in the second decade of the 21st century will help ameliorate the fake ID problem. Uh, and but then it was suggested there was an interim way to deal with that. Uh, I'd be curious about your comments on that. And uh, then secondly, um, you know the the issue. I mean, we have we have the, that. Then we also have the the process uh, itself and and the identified problems when it was it wasn't dependent on the fake ID, but actually the adulterants and and the other issues and the fact that. I believe GAO said that uh, they made a point that they felt you had too few people to monitor compliance, not just for drug testing, but generally, I, as I took their comment, which is something we've talked about previously, uh, and I know you're constrained by your OMB masters, but, uh, but they pointed also to a high failure rate, even with that small number of compliance reviews in the drug testing area, I believe they said 40% and it doesn't seem to have a consequence. So if you could comment on those two issues. Sure. Well, first of all, I, I don't believe that we should wait on the real ID uh, to start dealing with credentialing issues in this process. Uh, one of our frustrations as an agency is that we don't have the ability to levy fines against these collection sites. We have to go through this uh, process of a public interest exclusion called a PIE, and before we ever get to the PIE, we have to end give them a notice of a PIE, and before that, we obviously go out and gather the facts from the individuals, and we, during that process, they're aware that there's somebody looking into their behavior, so they either clean it up or they go out of business and recreate themselves. And so we have done this repeatedly, and the inference was we aren't really using the PIE process. Well, the PIE process is designed to uh, give advance notice, and they get the advance notice, and they, they don't really clean up their act, they just go out of business. So I think that's one of the frustrations, and I think if we had the, the ability to levy a fine or some kind of penalty, it would deal with what Congressman Duncan indicated uh, in his comments earlier, that there'd be a sanction, there'd be an enforcement provision to this process. Now, the second thing, uh, I really would like to say to you that uh, we have a, a ready-made solution for this problem. It's complex, and it is going to be difficult, and I think during the next reauthorization, we're going to have to talk about how do we build in with existing resources, whether at the state level or at the federal level, to, to give the kind of the monitoring that we need to do with this. I, I will tell you that uh, we have found the states to be very agreeable to involving themselves in controlled and alcohol, uh, controlled substance and alcohol enforcement. And I believe that we can do a better job of giving them guidance and helping them with things like the Oregon Trucker Chuck program. But it is very labor intensive, and there are going to be issues that we're going to have to deal with with having officers. For example, a large contingent of the workforce in this country doing commercial vehicle safety is not 
a law enforcement officer. They are a limited civilian employee who doesn't have the authority to engage in law enforcement related practices. So that's something that we're going to have to keep in mind, but we can work around that. That's just going to be something we have to deal with. So whether we do it in the form of grants or an expanded federal workforce, uh, we're going to have to have resources to address this problem in the next reauthorization. I'm convinced of that. And uh, because the, as you indicated, to uh, really deal with fraud at the site, you're going to have to get somebody in there to observe that. And that's going to take covert monitoring. It's going to labor intensive. We do that now with CDL monitoring. It's very labor intensive. And it, it's going to be a decision, a policy call, of whether that's where we want to use our resources. And, and finally, I would just say, in managing the risk of the commercial vehicle safety program, I can tell you that I'd like to look at this committee and say, let's save 300 lives next year by getting every trucker in this country to wear a safety belt, because we lose 300 a year because they don't wear a safety belt. We're losing 1% due to some kind of controlled substance or alcohol abuse in, in commercial vehicle crashes, which is too much. And I'm certainly not saying we tolerate it, but in terms of addressing risk, we need to apply our resources where we get the most reward. And I believe that that's what we're trying to do through addressing more driver focus in our programs. We've seen a 9% increase in the number of driver-related inspections in this country. That's because we're changing the focus away from vehicle-related activities to driver inspections. And, and the story that I told about Maryland is something that we're seeing readily. Troopers along the road are stopping vehicles with CMB operators, noticing some kind of paraphernalia or, or drug abuse, and then we're following up to disqualify those people using imminent hazard. And we were not doing that before, and it's something we've started using more readily in this past 12 to 15 months. Well, thanks. I, I would just reflect, and certainly I, we would want to be doing what we can to encourage that the uh, drivers use their safety belts, but that ultimately is a self-inflicted injury or death as opposed to uh, a driver under the influence who takes out a swath of passenger cars who are totally innocent victims. Um, so that's, I would just make that little distinction there that um, in terms of why we're, we want. On, uh, so um, the, the issue, your response on the labs, I mean, if you had a fining authority, if that were a more highly valued, I mean, ultimately, I think what you're going to find is that we're going to end up somehow probably with fewer labs. Uh, it's going to probably be a more highly valued product, so they're going to charge the employers more. And there's also, I would like to see a regime that you can monitor and find them, and that would provide some potential revenue for the people to actually monitor the process. I mean, that seems to me be, to be a way you could begin to clean that up. I mean, SAMHSA now looks at the labs, and you, I think you said there were 44 certified labs and you have 144 people to monitor those labs? 40, 46 labs, 114 inspectors. They look at them on site two times a year, each lab, right. every year. Do you have any thoughts on how we could clean up the problems at the collection sites, given your experience in monitoring the labs? There are multiple groups that are advocates and specialties, uh, professional staff that work in associations. That's certainly one way, uh, both internal self-policing as well as national standards, best practices, um, more aggressive understanding by the employers who hire these commercial services as to what their roles and responsibilities are under contract law to make sure that the work they're getting meets the standards and expectations. When you have a failed collection, it costs that employer not only uh, the, the cost of the missed test and the time that the person was there, and this isn't all about pre-employment testing, this is existing random testing, a person being out of service while they go to this collection site to get a test that doesn't work uh, is, is certainly uh, an expensive area. I would think that uh, those are certainly things that could be done. Um, better. We spend a lot of our time on the laboratory side training physicians as medical review officers in, in specialty groups within the American Medical Association to perform their, their task knowledgeably uh, and understand what a drug test does and what it doesn't do and what their roles and responsibilities are. We do that for the federal agencies and very similar programs are also established under the Department of Transportation and they participate too. 
So professional education for the people who have to do these things is certainly one major piece that I think we ought to bank on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, everybody, no matter what <coughs> their, their job or position or occupation is, should always, <coughs> should always be trying to do more and do better and to improve. But let me see if I can summarize what I've learned from this hearing. And, and uh, Administrator Hill, you say that the truck drivers overall are the safest drivers in the country. And, and we've been given statistics saying that they're involved um, in only around 2% of the, um, are, are the drugs and alcohol are involved in only about 2% of the accidents. And, and, um, <coughs> and I think a similar percentage on the number of commercial drivers involved in, in, in uh, some of these, uh, in the wrecks that are occurring. Uh, now, <coughs> truck, uh, truck drivers or truck uh, companies have pressure and incentive from a monetary standpoint to make sure that they don't hire uh, drivers who are addicted to drugs because the trial lawyers are going to uh, help a lot on that. I mean, they're going to be sued if they uh, uh, hire uh, uh, drug addict truck drivers who are going to be in, in wrecks, in frequent wrecks, and in addition to lawsuits for injuring other people, uh, uh, drug-addicted uh, drivers are going to uh, cost their employers a lot of money by damaging their tr uh, trucks and so forth. So there's a lot of pressure that way that is very effective, I think. Uh, in addition, I don't think we should give the impression that not much is being done here because uh, I, I noticed in your testimony, you're, you say that your inspectors are inspecting three million, it was it three million uh, trucks a year, is that correct? Uh, and they look for drugs and alcohol at, at that time. That's, it's three million nationwide and predominantly by the states, but our people also do a small percentage of those, yes. Well, and in, in controlled right. substance and alcohol is three very million. Fine. And then, uh, then uh, the um, the people who are enforcing the uh, traffic laws, the state troopers, and the uh, even the local law enforcement people are stopping uh, some trucks at times, and and uh, so there's there's uh, uh, checks that way. In addition to these two million drug tests, now a lot of them apparently. <coughs> They can get around pretty easily, or, or some of them are not legitimate. But, but I would assume also that a lot of these two million drug tests are legitimate tests because uh, truck company owners would have pressures and incentive to make sure that those tests were legitimate. Would you agree with that? Well, there's and, definitely. And plus, you're doing. You said in your testimony also that you're doing. Your agency is doing a lot of work with truck co truck, uh, truck companies to make sure that they're. Testing is legitimate. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Congressman Duncan, we're doing uh, two primary focus areas at this point, uh, in addition to the random uh, roadside inspection process. Right. The first one is through the safety audit. This committee required us as an agency to do new entrant audits of anyone coming into the, con into the business for the first time. And within 18 months, we're required to do a safety audit. Now, what we found basically during that safety audit process is that a lot of these companies are passing the safety audit even though they don't have compliance with some of these issues. And the program, the way it was set up initially, was primarily designed to be an educational outreach. And so we as an agency said, look, this is not the direction we need to go. We need to refine this. So we put out a notice of proposed rulemaking in 2006 to change the new entrant program to make it more enforcement-based and to stop entry if you have certain uh, violations that are occurring. One of those is drug and alcohol. That notice of proposed rulemaking is presently, uh, we've, we've finalized the analysis, the comments, we're preparing the final rule, and that rule will be out hopefully in uh, 2008 as well. And what that will do is it'll say, if you have employees that you're using that are testing positive for drugs, you're not going to be allowed to continue. We're going to revoke their operating authority and put right. them out of business. The second thing we'll do is if they don't have a drug and alcohol testing program out of service till you get it fixed, you will not be allowed to operate. So those are major changes that we're right. making in the new entrant process okay. to, to fix that. All right. And then 
then you have these uh, major associations, the American Trucking Association and the Owner Operator Independent Drivers Association, and both of them are, are making efforts to help on this problem as well. Is that correct? Well, I, they both commented to the rule, and we are taking their suggestion as we move forward with this process, yes. And uh, I believe there's been a, a suggestion or recommendation about a, a national clearinghouse. Are you yeah. familiar with that? I am aware of ATA's proposal to do that, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it, a lot is being done is, is, is really the point here, and, and we're, we're making great strides here on this problem. Uh, but you do need uh, some uh, better enforcement mechanisms for these uh, uh, facilities when you find that their drug uh, uh, testing programs are uh, inadequate. Is that correct? Yes, we, we have the ability to cite them but then we put them through an administrative process to revoke their ability to be involved in that in the future. And I really think that money, fines, and penalties works effectively, and that's one of the things that we've used in the motor carrier industry to deal with people who don't want to comply with our regulations. So I think that would benefit us if, in dealing with the collection site issue. Well, now let me ask you this one last question. Um, we, we've been given st uh, statistics that drugs and alcohol are involved in only 2% of these uh, uh, commercial uh, vehicle accidents, and that only about 2% of these drug tests uh, uh, turn out positive. But we heard from the uh, North Carolina official, and then we've been given these statistics from the uh, Oregon uh, tests that was uh, done April 10th to the 12th for 491 drivers, 487 samples. And they, they found uh, drugs uh, in 9.7% of their tests. Now, they said if you remove uh, the opiates in half the situations, uh, um, because some of this could be medicine, would be, it would move down to 8%. And then if you eliminate the opiates entirely, it would be 6.4%. But based on, on their findings in North Carolina and Oregon, do you, do you think this problem is is uh, is more widespread than these two percent figures that uh, we've been given I wish that I had a, a good answer for you because um, you know, I would think that if we were killing more people related to controlled substance it would show up in the in the crash report data that we have I investigated hundreds thousands of crashes when I was involved as a state policeman Right. over 29 years. It was, we had a lot of tools and resources to find out. In every fatal crash, you draw a blood sample. You find out if there's alcohol or drugs in that system. Right. If you have people who are seriously injured, you, you pull a blood sample or you, you do some kind of analysis for uh, reasonable suspicion or, or post-accident testing. So I think that we would find that there was more involvement in crashes if this were more of a widespread problem. Now, I, I commend the Oregon State Police for doing this program. And well, frankly, in your 29 years in Indiana, do you think that it, it, in all those uh, accidents that you personally dealt with, was, was it roughly 2%, to, do you think? Or, <laughs> or do, you, do you have any wild guess? Well, I, I, I just know that we were able to identify people involved in fatal crashes that were, were contributing because of controlled substance because of the blood test, and I would say that it was a very low percentage when very I was low. doing it. But I can't give you empirical data from my All experience. All right. Thank you very, thank yes. you very much. Uh, I thank gentlemen. There was the self-reporting figure, which I believe was 7.4%, uh, and I don't know that many people who would self-report they were abusing a substance if they weren't, but maybe they wanted to make something up. Uh, Ms. Napolitano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Hill, I'm, I'm very interested in, in um, much of what is being discussed as uh, it relates to the safety of, of um, people, generally. Um, in, in speaking, I wasn't here for a lot of the questioning, unfortunately, because I was detained elsewhere. But you indicate that um, your agency has begun a compliance initiative to identify the drivers to comply with the return to duty process. Um, does that initiative um, look at uh, drivers who may have drug content in their urine 
that is due to medication, and how does that medication impede them, or is it affecting their ability to drive competently? Well, Congresswoman Napolitano, I would say to you that uh, the reason why we started this initiative is that there are some very concerned members in the industry that have been witnessing firsthand the movement, what we call job hoppers, people, truck drivers testing positive and going to different carriers. And uh, they've been very frustrated with the fact that the driver just doesn't have to self-report and therefore they can leave their employment with that particular carrier and then move to another one and infect that other carrier with their same drug habit or drug problem. And so we've sat with them and said, look, we've got to figure out a way to begin to address this. So we ask our investigators, we formed a, a team to go into these MROs and look at people who were testing positive for drugs. Any drug? Uh, well, the five that are required to be tested through the HHS process that Mr. Stevenson alluded to in his, his opening comments. The people who test positive for that one of those five drugs we then have reconfigured our IT systems that allows us to track drivers as opposed to just carriers. Historically, we've looked at carrier databases. Now we're, we're refining that so that we can see where a driver is moving to work for different carriers. So if we have a name of a driver who's tested positive through one of these facilities, been unemployed or, or terminated from that one carrier, and then shows up working for a different carrier subsequent to that test, we go out and we investigate the new carrier. Did they do the pre-employment testing? Did they have the procedures in place? Are they doing random testing? And then fourthly, we go after that driver and we file a driver case against him or her, and then we use our imminent hazard authority and say, look, this driver's an imminent hazard. You need to get out of the interstate no, commerce. And I understand, sir. Uh, my question deals more with any individual who is driving who may be under a doctor's uh, orders uh, to take certain medication, whether it's for schizophrenia, for diabetes, for anything else. Uh, and, and I'm not I'm not sure what drugs might have a um, detrimental effect on the dr uh, driving ability of that individual. That's more what I'm referring to. And have you looked at anything that might be posing a problem in those particular um, medically prescribed drugs? That's my question. We have been working diligently through our medical review board to establish a new set of regulations that govern medical qualifications for commercial vehicle drivers. This is something we've been working uh, to address the NTSB most wanted recommendations in which they think that the medical regulations need to be updated. So we have been in the process of doing that. And our medical review board, a panelist of experts in the medical field, have been addressing this particular problem and they have actually given us some recommendations that we're going to be considering as we move ahead and redo our regulations. Thank you. So that we was, are doing that. That's what, what, what I was uh, uh, trying to get to. Uh, and I understand that the independent drivers not necessarily self-report that they are required to go to a base entity to be able to do the self-reporting. And if they're found, they may or may not go back to uh, uh, retest or uh, be able to be uh, cleared for driving. And they may not, not report that particular uh, job and skip and be able to go and obtain another job. That's a big question for me on independent drivers. Well, it's, it's true um, with independent drivers, but it's also true with other uh, carriers as well. I wouldn't just relegate it to the owner independent drivers. And that's why we started this process that I told you about in these independent investigations to track these people. But I want to tell you it's very labor intensive, it takes time, we're committed to doing it, but it's not something we just do thousands in a day. It, it's, it's something that takes a little time to track them and, and do the investigative steps, but we're committed to doing it. What would help you then identify the amount of um investment, if you will, to set up such a, a tracking um, mechanism to be able to tie in the states if they go from one state to another. And so they would be able then to identify those drivers who are at risk. And then further, do we have a mechanism to be able to go after 
the uh, uh, damage caused, and I know most of it falls upon insurance companies, but certainly somebody has to have liability for being able to not only hire, but also drive a, a vehicle while being impaired. Well, I would just say to you that uh, this response that I gave to the chairman earlier about our CSA 2010 rulemaking that we're developing is designed to help us track where these people are. That's one of our problems right now. We have to literally go out and find people who tested positively, and then we have to track them to where they go in the carriers. And this reporting mechanism that we referred to earlier will allow us to have that information readily available and eliminate a lot of the investigative foot -like footwork that we have to do now to go find those If people. you had a crystal ball, what would that take in funding? What, what would be able to help you expedite your ability to be able to put that in place? That's a, that's a question that I'm going to have to get back with the record. I, I have, appreciate I'm not it, prepared to answer that here today, but it, it's a valid question, and we'd like to get back with you on that. I appreciate it, because the lives of a lot of people could be at stake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Mr. Platt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you and the ranking members' efforts on the issue, as, long, as well as our, our witnesses here today on all the panels. Um, Minister Hill, I wanted to follow up on um, your comments regarding uh, new entries and, and uh, apologize with trying to be at four places at once. If I cover something that you've already addressed, uh, do apologize in advance. Um, in your comments and in your written testimony, you talked about the new entrant rule for 08. Um, you and I have spoken before about the regulations being proposed and, and working way through. Is that, are we referencing the same issue here, the same set of regulations, or is, is this something different? I believe that um, there are two issues that you and I have discussed. One is the new entry, uh, the, the training of new drivers into the marketplace. Correct. And then the specific new entrant is specifically about the carrier itself and how the carrier complies with the regulations and how we monitor that process. Okay, so they're related but two separate issues then? And two separate rulemakings, yes, sir. Okay. Um, on, the, on the one we've talked about before, uh, my understanding is that that's at OMB with the, the requirements for new drivers as far as yes. behind the wheel training things. Is there any new estimate? And I know it's somewhat out of your hands because it's at OMB, but are you, have you been given any estimate from OMB um, given that this is something that started back in 04 and with the 05 court decision now in 07, are they giving you any time frame? Well, they, they have a minimum of 90 days to review it. Uh, we, we are dialoguing with them about that, so I can assure you that uh, we are expressing our interest in moving this rule along. We know that the court is interested as well, and so we, we have a vital interest in making sure this, this uh, notice of proposed rulemaking gets out. Do you think that will happen before the end of the year? It's our plan to. Okay. On the new, uh, the other regs with the new entrant rule, uh, in your written testimony you talk about um, as part of your testimony that of the 40,000 new entrants that you reviewed, that 42% of those programs were counseled for deficiencies and that the proposed new entry rule will, will help address this. Could you, uh, one, highlight what the most common type of deficiency you found and how the new rule will likely address the, that and you know, similar deficiencies? Sure. Well. At the top of the list uh, is that the carrier doesn't have a policy in place about dealing with drug and alcohol, which usually implies that they don't have a drug and alcohol testing program. Uh, close right after to not having a policy is they don't do drug and alcohol testing. So they aren't doing pre-employment, random testing, post-accident, under reasonable suspicion. Um, what I tried to say in my uh, comments there was that the new we recognized this back in 2003. Is that look, you, you can't allow people to come into the business and, and just educate them and hope it gets better. You've got to take some action, and that's why we have put into place a notice of proposed rulemaking to tighten that up. Now, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to front end load the work. Instead of catching these people after they've been in commerce and then do compliance reviews, we're hoping to deal with that on the front end. And not having a drug and alcohol program or using a driver that has tested positively will preclude you from a, uh, continuing on in interstate commerce, and that's, that's mm -hmm. going to be the key and it's going to get people's attention. They're either going to comply or they're going to be out of business. So, so today, uh, without that new rule uh, adopted, not having a program in place, not having the, the testing done, doesn't prohibit you from being out there. That's correct. Now, we, we can do a compliance review and, and go back in, which we do in several cases. But 
in terms of the, the strict mechanism to preclude them from continuing on, that is not in place, and we needed regulatory authority to do that. The, um, it's because the way it is now, it's, it's almost like you have to, something has to happen that you're likely to do that compliance review and, and catch them as opposed to being across the board requirement and they be in essence certified to have that program in place? Yes, Congressman Platts, that's correct. So again, it's a, a, a proactive uh, rather right. than reactive. That's right. Okay. Well, I, I think that's a very necessary and appropriate approach. Commend the department and the um, agency for uh, promulgating that, that regulation and, and hopefully we'll get it through the process quickly Thank along you. with the other one regarding the, uh, the training requirements. So. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Platts. Uh, three quick uh, questions following up on that. And as I understand, so you're going to have a new authority to deal with new entrants who don't have programs to prohibit them from continuing to operate? Yes, sir. What about the 70% the of, of existing firms who are found uh, to have violations of drug testing who are ongoing? Do you have the authority to put them out of service too, and has that ever been done? Um, in the past seven years, six years, we have uh, done about 31,000 enforcement cases. So we bring an enforcement case against them, give them a penalty, but we don't stop them from operating. Mm -hmm. Under the CSA 2010 initiative that I referred to earlier, mm -hmm. what we plan to do is we say, look, there are certain things that are so fundamental to a carrier's operation that you cannot be safe and not do them. Okay, so it won't just be new entrants, it'll be ongoing problems with but, compliance. But, are, but they're two separate rulemaking processes, and I want okay. you to understand right. that. So, okay. Yes, but that is the plan, that we will actually go in and declare them unfit if they're a carer involved in not having a drug and alcohol program or they're using a driver that tests positively. So in the 70% of the compliance reviews since 2001, where you found violations of drug testing programs, have you gone back and verified that those 70 percent have corrected those deficiencies? Normally, as a, Mr. Chairman, as a part of our process, we engage into not just giving them a, uh, a notice of claim and then they pay their penalty, but we actually engage in settlement agreements. Our goal is to get compliance. So as a part of that settlement agreement, they have to verify with us that they have instituted a program and that we have verified that they are using a consortium or third party. Mm -hmm. But right now, you don't have a big club over them. You're going to have the big club in the future with the out of service. It will be bigger, yeah. and larger. But right now, we do have a club because if they're in that settlement agreement and they don't comply, we can come back and, and hit them pretty hard. Mm -hmm. and so we, we, I wouldn't discount that, but it will be much stronger with the unfit rating in the future. Um, okay, thank you. And then just a, a quick. Uh, for entertainment value, uh, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, can you, since passyourdrugtest.com says they carry FDA-approved drug test detoxification programs for passing serious drug tests, are you aware if there are any FDA-approved drug test detoxification programs for passing tests? I can imagine there's detoxification drugs for people, you know, trying to kick a habit, but you ever hear such a thing? Absolutely not. Okay. It is a it is a wild claim that's on the internet, and I would love to have someone show me to the contrary because it'd be I'd be like a pit bull. Okay. I'd be more than glad to follow up on it. Well, we'd love to have you do that. Um, that would be good. And then, uh, Mr. Administrator, just given my other uh, the other uh, site we mentioned here, we're at the Ross Healthcare Clinic, who apparently does uh, driver medical exams and drug testing who refers people as a favorite link to a site on how to beat the tests. Uh, is there some action you could take regarding uh, their status uh, since they are doing commercial truck driver medical exams and drug testing? If uh, the information that you have is accurate, some will be knocking at their door very shortly and I will okay. uh, take the appropriate action commensurate with my authority to deal with that problem. And I'll get back with the committee on the results. Excellent. Thank yes, you. You're welcome. I have no, no further questions. No. Okay. Thank, again, I, I realize this was an unusual procedure, but I thought of the GAO and the other information was so startling that it was necessary for you to hear it. I appreciate your indulgence of time. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. What?
Oh, <laughs> acronyms are, are flying like snow. Uh, there will be QFRs, questions for the record. <laughs> and if we could now, we'll call the uh, final uh, uh, witnesses. And I have a, a group of parliamentarians from uh, Britain here. I've got to step out. Ms. Napolitano will take the chair. For, thank you. Good afternoon, gentlemen, and welcome. Uh, I believe we uh, will start uh, the questioning of the third panel with Mr. Woodruff. Sorry, I didn't give you a chance to clear. Thank you. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Duncan, and other members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to communicate ATA's recommendations on drug and alcohol testing. I'm Greer Woodruff, Senior Vice President of Corporate Safety and Security for J.B. Hunt Transport, an active member of ATA. J.B. Hunt is a large motor carrier operating in the contiguous 48 states and Canada. We have approximately 11,700 power units, 56,000 trailers and containers and employ over 13,500 truck drivers. In the last year, J.B. Hunt has performed more than 39,000 DOT drug tests, more than 1,700 DOT alcohol tests, and over 14,000 non-DOT tests using hair specimens. ATA has long been a proponent of alcohol and drug testing for truck drivers and actively supported the omnibus Transportation Employee Testing Act of 1991. My comments are aimed at improving drug and alcohol testing in the trucking industry, and I will cover two of the five recommendations provided in written testimony. Number one, the need for a national clearinghouse for positive drug and alcohol test results, and secondly, the industry's desire to use alternative specimen testing methods such as hair testing. Concerning the national clearinghouse, this recommendation is, is aimed at closing a serious loophole in the federal drug and al alcohol testing regulations, which is being exploited by too many drug abusing drivers. The loophole is as follows. A driver applies for a job at a trucking company and tests positive for drugs on the DOT required pre-employment drug test. As a result of testing positive, the driver is not hired. In many cases, the driver simply waits a short amount of time to cleanse his system a few days or perhaps a few weeks and applies for a job at a different trucking company and passes the DOT required pre-employment test. The driver does not self-report the previous positive test result on the employment application and therefore the second trucking company is not aware of the driver's previous positive test result. This loophole exists because the driver is supposed to self-report since there is no current method of centrally capturing positive test results. ATA made Congress aware of this loophole in the late 1990s when it first began advocating for a national clearinghouse. FMCSA studied this issue and submitted a report to Congress in May of 2004. This report found that a centralized clearinghouse for positive results to be queried by motor carriers during the hiring process was feasible, cost-effective, and more importantly, could improve safety. Currently, five states have positive drug test results reporting laws. However, drug and alcohol testing in trucking is done in compliance with federal regulations, and it is a national program. In order to close the loophole I described, ATA urges Congress to pass legislation to authorize and fund a centralized national clearinghouse for positive drug and alcohol test results. The final issue I will address is the need for alternative specimen testing. ATA seeks congressional support 
to encourage the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the U.S. Department of Transportation to move forward with rulemaking that will allow the use of alternative specimen testing methods such as hair. These alternative methods have shown great promise in applied situations to detect lifestyle drug users and those that seek to evade the current urine collection method of controlled substance testing. Information from ATA's membership indicates that the typical chronic user is more likely to show a positive drug test result when a hair specimen is employed. ATA is eager to work with Congress and DOT to allow for the addition of specimen options beyond urine, such as hair. In summary, Mr. Chairman, ATA urges Congress to enhance drug and alcohol testing in the trucking industry by establishing a national clearinghouse for drug and alcohol test results, directing SAMHSA and DOT to complete rulemaking to allow alternative specimen te testing methods, banning the sale of adulterant and substitution devices, and providing for enforcement and penalties for their use, encouraging the DOT to better focus their random testing rate requirements, and finally, assuring good practices are followed by, by drug and alcohol collection sites. Thank you for the opportunity for ATA to offer its recommendations. I will be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Woodruff. And that, that, that kind of tickles the imagination about other ways of uh, providing material for the testing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Craig. Congresswoman uh, Napolitano, uh, Ranking Member Duncan, thank you for inviting me to testify this afternoon on behalf of our nation's small business trucking professionals. My name is Rick Craig. I currently serve as Director of Regulatory Affairs for OIDA. The members of OIDA believe that drug and alcohol testing for commercial vehicle operators has played an important role in, ra in raising the level of safety on our nation's highways. However, there are problems with existing regulations, procedures, and enforcement that should be addressed to ensure that testing programs are effectively employed while also mindful of the significant harm that may be caused to a trucker's life and livelihood by errant administration. The sheer volume and complexity of state and federal drug and alcohol testing regulations make it extremely difficult for motor carriers to run their own testing programs. Thus, nearly all carriers rely on service agents to administer various aspects of their programs. Of the many benefit programs and services offered to our members, OOIDA administers a drug and alcohol testing consortium and third party uh, administrator program, or CTPA. Our CTPA provides a full range of services to keep its motor carrier clients and their commercial drivers in compliance with federal drug and alcohol testing requirements, including dissemination of extensive educational informational or information related to testing and reporting requirements. I have provided copies of the, these materials to the committee. OIDA CTPA has experienced a multitude of problems with existing drug and alcohol testing regulations and procedures. Most problems are relatively minor and correctable, but nonetheless may serve to illustrate the various reasons why certain carriers and drivers fail to comply. Certain other problems are much more serious and may substantially impact or even destroy a trucker's driving career. Uh, examples of problems commonly encountered by OIDA are, are outlined in my written testimony. Many of these same problems have been echoed uh, by other witnesses. One area I would like to highlight is that collection process has always been and remains to be the weakest link in the DOT testing program. The findings of the GAO are indeed alarming. We absolutely agree that problems identified by the GAO and this committee must be addressed as soon as possible. However, speaking on behalf of the vast majority of men and women who operate trucks and who do not abuse drugs or misuse alcohol, I ask that the committee be careful not to draw the assumption that problems with specimen collection and testing procedures equate to our nation's highways being filled by drug-crazed truckers. That scenario is certainly not reality. At the core of OIDA's membership are owner-operators. These small business trucking professionals commonly lease their equipment and their driving services to motor carriers that operate multiple trucks within their fleet. Any carrier that leases an owner-operator assumes the responsibility for compliance for all safety regulations no differently than their employed drivers. In fact, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations specifically include independent contractors or owner-operators in the definition of an employee. Motor carriers are primarily 
Motor carriers primarily contract their service agents uh, to administer uh, drug and alcohol testing programs. However, carriers are ultimately responsible for ensuring that service agents meet the qualifications set forth in the rules. While a service agent may provide educational materials to the carrier, it is the responsibility of the carrier to provide the materials to its drivers. And that explains the rules as well as the carrier's policies and procedures. More and more owner operators are obtaining operating authority while continuing to perform driver duties. A one, a one truck, one driver motor carrier must comply with both the requirements that apply to employers and the requirements that apply to drivers. Since the driver and carrier management are one and the same, and the carrier must establish the testing program and carrier policies, it is likely, the drive, is likely as the driver, this individual has a greater awareness of drug and alcohol testing requirements than many others in the industry. All carriers, regardless of, of size, are required to remove a driver from performing safety-sensitive functions in the event of a positive or equivalent test result. Each carrier must assign a designated employer representative to oversee this function and various other aspects of the carrier's testing program. Reliance upon a single employee carrier to remove him or herself from duty is a little different than simply accepting that any other designated employer representative will remove a much-needed employee from safety-sensitive duty. Uh, I'm about to run out of time. I think I'll skip ahead just a little bit. Uh, I would like to take a moment to comment on ATA's National Clearinghouse proposal. While ATA, or while, I'm sorry, while OIDA fully supports the goal of striving to make the trucking industry free of drug and alcohol abuse, we remain unconvinced of the need for a National Clearinghouse for positive drug and alcohol testing results. The national database as described in ATA's proposal does not ensure that a carrier removes a violating driver from performing safety sensitive functions, nor does it otherwise enhance the existing drug testing requirements. I have outlined several questions and concerns raised in my, uh, by the clearinghouse proposal in my written testimony. Until privacy, operational, security, and logistical oversight complications have been adequately addressed, the proposal has, no real, has the real potential to negatively impact drivers far beyond the scope of those who abuse drugs and misuse alcohol. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Craig. I do have the greatest respect for the truck drivers. The job they have is uh, very um, cri critical to the nation's economy. And I uh, worked in the industry for quite a while, so I understand a lot of the issues that they have. We also have a, a, a some that do not follow the rules, and because of them, we continue to implement laws to protect the whole country. I agree, Congresswoman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McLucky, welcome. Thank you, Congresswoman Napolitano, Ranking Member Duncan. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today on drug and alcohol testing for drivers. Testimony this morning was quite shocking, but I do not think that drug and alcohol abuse in the trucking industry is rampant, and I hope that conclusion uh, is not reached by the committee. <clears throat> Most of our members are hardworking, law-abiding citizens who perform a very difficult task every day. The Teamsters Union has a long history of being proactive in deterring the abuse of controlled substances and alcohol in the trucking industry. For well over two decades, we have negotiated drug and alcohol testing programs with virtually all of our larger trucking employers. The language in our collective bargaining agreements ensure that the testing programs comply with both the provisions of the agreements and FMCSA regulations. The agreements outline the process that must be followed to allow workers who have substance abuse issues the opportunity to obtain treatment and rehabilitation prior to returning to work in safety sensitive functions. Almost all of those members testing positive take advantage of treatment and re rehabilitation and return to duty. We have a once-in-a-lifetime second chance that most of our members take advantage of. The results of the recent Oregon State Police roadside testing are potentially skewed. The almost 10 percent positive rate could be attributed to several issues. The OSP included three additional drugs, all of which are not included in the FMCSA five-panel drug screen for which analysis were conducted that contributed to the higher overall rate of positive test results. For example, commercial motor vehicle operators are not prohibited from using propoxyphene, provided that such use is monitored and approved by the driver's physician. These opiates and synthetic opiates accounted for 19 of the 47 tests for which controlled substance was identified. Also, drug testing results not validated by a medical review officer leave open the strong possibility 
that some of the positives were due to a legitimate medical explanation. For example, the driver had a valid prescription from his physician. Occupational injury data provided by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that truck drivers were among the group of workers who experienced the most work-related injuries and illnesses with days away from work. Therefore, it is not unusual that these workers would use painkillers, some of which may contain opiates to mitigate discomfort resulting from work-related injuries. And many drivers have legitimate prescriptions for these painkillers and consequently may be allowed in some instances to operate commercial motor vehicles without violating FMCSA regulations. Because there was no positive test result validation process incorporated in the OSP study, the assumption is that all positive opiate test results were due to illegal or improper use of controlled substances, which may be an erroneous assumption. There are also cases where drivers have legal prescriptions for amphetamines and may drive while using the controlled substance. For example, the use of the pres prescription drug Adderall, which is oftentimes used to control attention deficit, hyperactivity, or treatment-resistant depression can cause a positive test result. However, a driver who has been properly prescribed the drug is not automatically disqualified from operating a commercial motor vehicle. Further validation of even lower positive drug testing rates for drivers can be found in unionized, large, less than truckload carriers. The IBT reviewed the random drug testing results for large LTL carriers for the period 2003 to 2006. During this period, the union LTL companies conducted 64,477 random drug tests, of which 395 were validated by medical review officers as being positive for a positive test rate of 0.6 percent. That's six-tenths of one percent, much lower than the FMC survey rate of around two percent. This lower rate may be attributable, attributable to an older workforce with low turnover rate. I'm told also that in those 64,000 plus drug tests, only five cases uh, were found to use adulterated substances. We have significant concerns about the creation of a national clearinghouse for positive testing results, especially with respect to issues related to driver privacy. However, when we consider the fact that certain states, such as North Carolina, have moved forward in collecting this data, we are the opinion that a national clearinghouse operated by the federal government may be preferable to these data being collected on a state-by-state -state basis. The IBT could support the implementation of a centralized reporting and inquiry system and believes such a system could have positive safety benefits, provided, however, that such a requirement should only be imposed if and when the FMCSA is able to devise a system that would adequately protect the driver's confidentiality, provide a reasonable mechanism for drivers to learn of and report reporting errors, and devise a uniform and fair method for expunging the records of drivers that have undergone treatment and are rehabilitated. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not reiterate our concern about drug and al alcohol testing procedures for Mexican drivers. Still, after more than a decade of negotiations, there is no lab in Mexico to certify uh, samples. Random drug testing is non-existent, with drivers knowing that they will be tested at the border because collection procedures and chain of custody practices are questionable. There, and there appears to be little, if any, enforcement against the use of drugs and alcohol by drivers on the Mexican side of the border. This concludes my testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. McLucky, and uh, uh, I'm lucky I get all three of you. <laughs> uh, I, I have a, a, a very, very, um, what I say, open mind about the issues because I did work uh, in my prior life uh, in the transportation department, I did have an opportunity to, to uh, ask a lot of questions of the State Transportation, uh, California Transportation Commission. And uh, we've heard a lot of the issues being continually being brought up. And in, in working through some of these things, and, and I understand, Mr. McLucky, the, the issue. That's why I brought up the, the medical concept of it, because there are some things that will affect uh, the analysis, the final analysis of the urine, as regards drugs that they have to take to continue being able to work, whether it's a back problem, whether it's a schizophrenia, whether, what, whatever it is. And my concern is that we are not uh, balancing them to be able to allow that employee the opportunity to continue making a living and operating safely. Do you want to address that? Well, I think it's very important that, that the uh, employee have the opportunity to have 
any positive result reviewed by the medical review officer in the instance especially where he's on a prescription drug. And as you say, in the trucking industry, um, the rate of, of, of injury and illness is very high. And uh, these, these drivers take these drugs to, to, to stay on the road and, and, and be able to make a living. So we, we encourage the, the continued examination of that issue. Uh, especially for long haul. Yes. Um, in, and uh, uh, Mr. Woodruff, the uh, current drug uh, and alcohol regulations require new employees to contact former employers regarding the jobs application, uh, especially for drug history. How responsive have former employers been uh, to the request and what enforcement actions, if any, or penalties uh, for those employers who are non-responsive and uh, if they're not, should there be? A very good question. Um, in October of 2004, uh, FMCSA implemented a safety performance history regulation. And uh, following implementation of that particular regulation, the responsiveness of former motor carrier employers has greatly improved. Um, I cannot speak for the whole ATA membership population, but for J.B. Hunt, uh, we would encounter uh, perhaps uh, one to two uh, employers per month. We hire five to 600 drivers a month and only one to two employers that would not uh, supply the information that they re are required to supply under the regulations. Um, we do report those to the associated administrator of FMCSA when they fail to meet their regulatory obligation to provide dr drug and alcohol data. We often find ourselves in a role of educating the other motor carriers as to what their regulatory responsibilities are. So we work through that. We normally get those. Really a bigger issue that I believe that we encounter with regards to having the information that we need to have available and the regulations require us to obtain is with carriers that go out of business, that are bankrupt, or are no longer able to be contacted. In 2004, 2005, and 2006, those three years total, there were over 4,700 trucking company bankruptcies of carriers with more than 10 trucks. So the number is even more significant when you consider the number of bankruptcies or closures of companies with less than 10 trucks. But in that three-year period, 4,700 motor carriers with more than 10 trucks whose drug and alcohol data is not available to future motor carriers that need that data. Um, with regards to J.B. Hunt, we experience about 20% of the driver applicants have one or more driving jobs in the past three years that we are unable to verify because that employer is uh, no longer available for us to talk to. So uh, we believe through having a central repository that that data would be in the repository and whether or not the company closes business or moves or change their, changes their phone number, that that data would still be available for future motor carriers to, uh, to access. Um, the ATA is recommending the uh, National Clearinghouse be set up for um, positive and refused drug and alcohol tests. Um, why does this have to be done at a national level, and can that be uh, something that will be helpful to identify those repeat offenders who should not be driving? Uh, that's another very good question. Um, the drug and alcohol pro uh, regulations that the trucking industry must comply with is a, uh, a national program, and it becomes very problematic for uh, the industry when they have to begin to start to comply with potentially 52 different state rules and regulations. As we have heard in the testimony, there's somewhere between five and seven different states that have positive results reporting requirements, and many of those are different. And uh, so it becomes very complicated for a motor carrier doing business throughout the United States to identify how to comply with a varied set of regulatory requirements where a national clearinghouse would have one standard um, for us to comply with. Gentlemen. Uh, yes, if I may. Um, you know, certainly we see that uh, there are 
obviously some drug users out there that slipped through the cracks, and I was rather surprised by some of the comments I heard today as well. But, uh, you know, with this National Clearinghouse, we do have some real concerns. Uh, and obviously, the privacy is very obvious. Uh, but there are... Uh, sir, how would you address the privacy issue? Well, certainly, when you, when, and I've read the, the draft language of the legislation that came from ATA, and, uh, and, they, and they talk about the privacy issues. Now, it's, it's certainly difficult to deal with that, but, but one thing would have to certainly be done is that, uh, that the system be very secure, uh, that the access to the system be limited to only those who have authorization, a real right to know. Uh, but, I mean, of course, one of the problems you get into there is how do you know that these individuals really have authorization, really have the right to know over time? Um, and then who's going to catch these folks that uh, violate uh, the system and, uh, and enter the system when they don't really have authorization? And then we also question who is going to uh, enforce uh, against anyone who violates uh, the requirements. Well, it, th that would go back to, I guess, uh, an unfunded mandate uh, for the states to be able to establish such a uh, um, network with the clearinghouse and be able to do it with, directly with the uh, trucking cor uh, companies to be able to ensure that their drivers had, were complying. Am I not correct? Uh, well, certainly, and, and if, if I might also add, um, uh, I, you know, as I started to say earlier, we also see some other problems with the process, and we certainly agree that the collection sites are by far the weakest link in the whole system. We have had some experiences with the collection sites that have given the drivers who came in to test erroneous information. A good example of that, and a repeated example of that, is a driver who goes in and for whatever reason cannot provide a, an adequate amount of specimen the first try. They are supposed to be required and instructed to drink water and stay there for at least three hours and, and attempt again. Many times we have uh, heard of instances where the collection site personnel simply say, oh, that's okay, come back tomorrow. Problem is, that's, once that driver leaves, that's determined a refusal, which, as you know, is equivalent to a positive result. That's a, that's a, very, be a very big issue. Also, another problem that we have is that even with MROs, and they haven't really been addressed, that's the medical review officers. They really are the, the last word in this whole process. And if there is an MRO, and we've experienced a couple of cases at least of MROs who have made wrong judgments on uh, whether or not a re test result should be confirmed as positive and, and entered that as positive, and there's very, very little recourse for drivers to clear their names after that's happened. Shouldn't it be then part of what they should be looking at is how the drivers may be able to clear the record if they can't prove or uh, through further testing be able to, to clarify? Absolutely. I mean, possibly there could be, um, as, it, as anyone would do uh, when they get a medical opinion, get a second opinion. Maybe uh, they should be able to dispute the first MRO's uh, determination of a confirmed positive. Uh, another thing is we've had several members who were very adamant that, you know, be, as, to their knowledge, they could not possibly have tested positive for drugs. The MRO confirms that it's positive. And they have been very adamant, wanted to, do, to have these samples, mm -hmm. DNA tested. Well, you know, we have to tell them, you can go to that t trouble and expense if you like. The problem is it will do no good because it's not allowed under the rules. Mr. McLucky? Uh, two points, uh, Congresswoman. One is uh, we would prefer a national system with national standards, uniform standards, versus 50 state systems that all might have different criteria uh, and, and, and different, different requirements. Uh, secondly, we'd be concerned about uh, devising a, a method for expunging the records of drivers who have undergone treatment and rehabilitation. Uh, employers and medical review officers only keep records for a certain period of time. Uh, we just, we'd have to look at, at how long a person might be on this register if they've gone through a rehab process, uh, and it, would it be fair to keep them on this, keep, keep their violation on that, on that list forever? What would you consider um, adequate? I would say somewhere in the period of three to five years. 
if they had no further violations. Right, correct. Very interesting. It's a lot, a lot of substance in that. Um, Mr. Uh, Craig, um, the NTSB has said that the owner operators are the uh, precarious in, in the precarious position of overseeing their own substance abuse program. Um, the uh, protections are in place to ensure that all of the drug and alcohol program requirements are enforced, including those that mean putting a driver out of service after a positive test. How, how do you? Uh, uh, feel on that? Well, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a consortium that, uh, that OIDA runs. Um, and we have seen that as being a problem. Um, they're uh, really under the rules as they are right now. If someone refuses to test, there are certain exceptions where the CTPA, in an instance where you have a one truck, one driver motor carrier, will uh, enter that information as a refusal in the system, but the rules allow us to go no further. It takes the designated employer representative to, to order that driver out of service for safety sensitive duties uh, and go through the SAP process under those rules. The consortium has no method of doing that. But in, in the um, reality of things, not all the independent truck drivers belong to the association. No, they don't, uh, but they Basically, for a one truck, one driver motor carrier, though, they would have to participate in a random selection pool of two or more drivers. Obviously, as a single one, you can't do a random selection. So that's how the vast majority, I'm sure, I don't know of anyone who could not uh, ha participate with a consortium or a third party administrator of some sort so they could participate within their, uh, their drug testing pool. Thank you, Mr. Bozeman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Woodruff, would you describe how hair testing, how that method is sometimes is more advan advantageous over the urine test? Yes, Congressman Bozeman. Uh, J.B. Hunt has been conducting hair testing uh, of drivers for about a year now, um, and we are conducting hair testing along with uh, urine testing. We have to do urine testing to comply with the federal regulations. We do hair testing under a company policy test. We test for the same five panel drugs that the DOT uh, urine test requires. Uh, we uh, also um, use a medical review officer uh, review of those results as well, involving the interview of any drivers who have a positive result. Um, so we're trying to follow uh, the best that we can a similar protocol as DOT in terms of the drugs we test for, the cutoff levels, and the uh, uh, process and we are finding a uh, a higher rate of positive drug use uh, when we use a hair specimen. We, they are very difficult to adulterate and to substitute. Um, so we would like to see that as a alternative specimen for complying with the federal requirements. If uh, I guess the follow up would be, what steps should be taken by Congress? and government agencies to encourage the use of alternative specimen testing. Do you have any? We would le like to see um, Congress direct SAMHSA and DOD DOT to finalize rules that would permit alternative specimens to be used by motor carriers if they so choose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me ask all of you, that, that, and we'll start with Mr. Woodruff, the current legislation authorizing transportation, drug, and alcohol testing has been in existence for several years. If Congress was to advocate a study of the effectiveness of the government mandated drug and alcohol programs, what are the, some of the areas that you all feel like should be examined? I'll begin and say that, um, you know, we've heard a lot of numbers here today uh, as to what the real positive rate is for uh, drug use, uh, illegal drug use among truck drivers. And probably the low ends, uh, 2 percent, which is the positive random rate that FMCSA reports. And then uh, we've heard numbers as high as maybe 10 percent and some others in between. The reality is, is that the positive rate for drivers is probably somewhere in the middle there. Um, in terms of, of studying the effectiveness, uh, you know, I think it would be a good idea that we do look at these alternative specimens. Uh, to determine whether or not uh, they could uh, provide us a, a better result and a more accurate result. Um, 
so that would be where I would start. And then, of course, we feel like the national repository would give the motor carriers the tools that they need to help be part of the solution to this, as opposed to putting this data into an FMCSA database that only enforcement people um, have access to. Uh, this is currently a requirement of the driver to disclose, the motor carrier to inquire with other prior motor carriers, and a requirement for other former motor carriers to provide that data. Uh, so we should be making uh, rules that make it easier for us to do what the regulations require of us. Mr. Craig. Yes, thank you, Congressman Bozeman. Um, you know, one, one thing, obviously, the rules are designed all across the board to prevent accidents and injuries and, and, and fatalities, certainly. Um, what we would like to see is a close, take a closer look at how the testing rates really correlate with accidents. What are, I mean, we've heard some, some, uh, some statistics thrown around there, but I don't know if, really, if uh, the agency has really been taking, FMCSA has really been taking a close enough look at that. Um, I mean, I don't really, uh, I don't know just uh, how much, I guess you could take a look at post-accident, obviously, uh, statistics and see how they compare with the random selection rate. Uh, obviously, another area, too, uh, is the collection sites. Um, as I mentioned, we see problems on one side and on, on the other, and uh, they are, they definitely need to be cleaned up. Um, there's one other thing, too, that we have considered that, that might work quite well that would have a dual effect. Um, the vast majority of truckers uh, or commercial drivers in general do not use drugs. However, they are all painted with the same brush and must participate in, in the same program, the same random selection rate and everything. Um, currently, the, the selection rate for random drug testing is at 50 percent. What we would kind of like to see is a system whereby those individuals who have passed a certain number of tests with negative results, pick a number, four or five, and have proven themselves to be non-drug users, to be placed into a lower random selection pool, a lower percentage selection rate of, say, 25 percent. And that would reward the non-drug users, and at the same time, it would, uh, uh, it would help out because they wouldn't be diluting the 50 percent testing pool. And we think that that would have a very good effect on, on the random selection process in the future. Thank you. I know we've got to go, uh, Madam Chair. We've got to vote on. Do you have anything in one minute that you'd like to add? Uh, sh certainly, Congressman. Uh, I think the testimony today supports uh, a collection facility oversight, the possible licensing of laboratory personnel, uh, getting these adulterating products off the market, and we'd certainly look at, at, at the use of, of alternative specimens. Uh, it might relieve some of the privacy issues related to uh, urine samples, uh, and we'd certainly be receptive to looking at, at those kinds of things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to the panel. I think uh, we do have to go and vote, and I don't think you want to sit here till next week because we're leaving after that. Uh, and uh, appreciate your uh, testimony. Uh, there will be some questions uh, uh, sent to you. would appreciate a prompt reply. The record will remain open for 10 work days for additional input from panel members and uh, anybody who has an interest in this matter. Um, with that, um, this uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you, gentlemen.